It all started 60 years ago with a $500 investment in a small store on Parliament Street in Toronto. 60 years later, Harry Rosen is an undisputed Canadian clothing giant. But there are still plenty of challenges ahead. For example, some big American names in retail are coming to town. So, here to examine all things past, present and future in Canadian retail, Larry Rosen. That's Harry's son. He's chairman and chief executive officer of the clothing chain since the year 2000. And Larry, we welcome you to TVO. Thank you, Steve. It's nice to be here. So take us back to 60 years ago. Um, wow. Parliament Street, 500 bucks. Where do you get the money, first of all? Well, my dad actually uh, borrowed it from his father. And I th I'm pretty sure he paid him back eventually. <laughs> uh, but it's, you know, it's hard to believe that was two years before I was born uh, that my dad started. He was 24 years old. And him and my uncle Lou, uh, two young guys, uh, started this little shop, 500 square feet, in a real offbeat part of Toronto in those days. It, Cabbage Town was uh, pretty off the uh, beaten track, and they, uh, they started this store, and out of, out of nowhere, they created this business through uh, passion. You know, my dad, uh, he, he loved customers. He used to keep little cards, and he learned about each one, and he'd ask for referrals, and uh, they bought they built a, a surprisingly successful business in an out-of-the-way location. And, it, you know, one of the things that very few people realize is that, you know, he was the young man's store. Like Harry in about 1957, he went down to New York. And in New York in those days, every, all the young people were wearing the natural shouldered look, the madman look. And... Um, in Canada, the stuff was very British. Everybody had these built-up stiff suits that, you know, they looked like armor. And Harry bought a suit down there, and he brought it up here, and he went to one of our local makers called Cambridge, uh, who still supply us to this day, and he had them knock it off, build, you know, and that became for the young businessman in Toronto, the hip suit. And everybody flocked down to Parliament Street, and got the Harry Rosen look, and that's where he really got the momentum started. And uh, Why clothing for him? You know, he, uh, he wasn't a, a, a great student, although he's always studied, but he, 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 he tired of school, and I think he just, he loved selling, and he loved selling quality. Um, if, you knew, if you know my dad, my dad's great. He's 82, and he's still full of piss and vinegar, and he's, he's got lots of energy. He still, still can often find him in the store on Saturdays when he's in town. He's, he's retired from active management, but he's still a very engaging guy. I certainly uh, get a lot of great advice from him. But he just loved quality, he loved clothing, he loved to dress, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it just seemed natural for him. And uh, I'm sure he didn't anticipate becoming uh, the Canadian legend in menswear. Well, it, it has become a legendary story. And can I ask you what your revenues are today? Do you give that information yeah, out? Yeah, sure, sure. We, uh, we're just about $300 million. We have about 1,000 employees. We're in the seven major markets across the country. How many we stores? Have, we have 16 stores. But they're, on an average, they're about 25,000 square feet. You Those do, are big stores. You do $300 million in business a year? Yes. Does anybody else get close to that? In the, in the quality men's segment, no. Nowhere, no, nowhere near. And the next biggest might be a third the size of us. What's your market share? Uh, we estimate it to be around 40 to 45 percent of the quality market. Hmm. The store is called, or the chain, I guess, is called Harry Rosen. But of course, Larry Rosen, the guy sitting in front of me, is the guy who's been running it for the last 14 years. When did that trans, or how did that transition come about? Well, you know. Um, <laughs> My, my story with Harry Rosen's goes back a long time, obviously. I started selling there in high school, and, and I, I love to sell. I mean, if there's one lesson I have for young people is learn how to sell. It's a, it's a great skill, and I was selling all through high school. And then I, I went on to become a lawyer, and I was practicing law in Toronto. And at that time, that was sort of the mid-'80s, my father started expanding across the country. And I was just, he started becoming the iconic brand he is now in the major cities. And I, I just was so proud of that. I went to him, I said, I have to be a part of this. And uh, he very graciously took me in and, and, you know, listen, I mean, it's not easy in family businesses, there's always issues, but he mentored me and, uh, or sometimes he tormented me, but he was, uh, <laughs> he was, uh, he was very supportive and, and I grew and, and then, uh, 
you know, in 2000, it became the right time for me to take a senior executive role. And uh, How many siblings are there in your family? Uh, I have two sisters and a brother. And, uh, um, you know, at one point, one of my sisters joined us in the business for a short time. But my brother is a surgeon out in Calgary. And my other sister is uh, an actress and a photographer. And she's uh, more on the artistic side. So I'm the only one who sort of fell into the business. And, uh, uh, you know, but it, one thing I, I value a lot is that it's a family business and a multi-generational family business. I mean, 60 years, I, I mean, the average business doesn't last 15 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. To be a 60-year-old family business and, um, is great. And I, I guess my dream in, in transition is that maybe one day I can pass this... Uh, this little puppy off to the next generation. Well, don't go there yet. I'm going to get to that, but I want to come back to, to your generation. Um, I don't know if you know the Vortman family out of Burlington, Ontario, but they had they make cookies. Yes, I, I remember their cookies. And they got 11 kids. And I think almost all of the 11 kids wanted to get into the business. And that's pretty difficult to find meaningful work when all 11 kids want to be the CEO. Did you have any of those issues uh, in terms of your dad deciding who's going to be his successor? You know, it. My dad was was very supportive of all his, all of the the kids, and uh, I guess I was the one who was more naturally interested in business. Um, you know, I, had, I I did a law degree, but I also did an MBA, and uh, I was passionate about business, and I was passionately uh, excited about being involved in a family business. So, I kind of. I kind of was the obvious, uh, the obvious one to fall into that role. I, I do have friends that have family businesses. I'm part of an international organization of uh, family businesses, and uh, I see these issues that you bring up. And uh, the way I, the way I view it is, uh, at the end of the day, it has to be a meritocracy. Um, and if you have 11 members competing, you have to, you have to be. Uh, you have to have outside assessment and outside advisors because at the end of the day, your biggest responsibility is to your people. I mean, we have a thousand employees. A lot of them have been with us a long time. And the responsibility that the ownership has is to make sure that we have a great place for them to work. And without top-notch management, it's, uh, you know, that's the key thing is making sure. So, How many uh, kids you got? I got three boys. And d does any of them look like they're interested? There, there seems to be some warning signs there. Uh, I, uh, I'm quite, a, quite excited about it. I can't be too public about it. They do have jobs, you know. But you would presumably love to turn over the business to one of them someday. You know, um, the fashion business is a young man's business. And um, I'm 57. I still consider myself a young man. But uh, I... I'd be a lot more comfortable having a, a younger, younger. I have other great management around me. Trust me, there are lots of incredibly talented people that have been with me for a long time, and have great fashion sense. But as far as a family member is concerned, I think it'd be nice to hand it off to a younger person in a certain amount of time, and maybe go explore the world a little more. Gotcha. Let's talk about the business in general. How tough is retail in Canada these days? Well, I think retailers like to whine a lot. Um, you know, I mean, some years are better than others. This last year was okay. I think we grew about 5%. Uh, not one of our better years, but we grew, and uh, uh, this year we're expecting a little stronger year. I think that, um, I think retail's always tough if you're not clear to your customers what you stand for. And, uh, uh, you know, I think you know, re retail does tend to be cyclical. You'll have a couple so-so years, then you'll have some outstanding years. But What's an outstanding year for you? Um, I like to see, you know, I mean, a few years ago we grew 15%. That's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a couple years like that. Uh, the last year grew only about 5%, but you know what? It, you, you recognize the cycle. We've been do I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> so you don't panic when revenues decline maybe 5% or 10% a year? Um, we well, certainly don't be happy about it. I mean, we haven't had one of those years of decline uh, since I think 2007 we had a slight decline. I mean, Canada was remarkable through that very deep, deep recession worldwide. I mean, we really, uh, we just moved sideways really. It was, uh, it was incredible how well we, we did. Have you had to close a store? 
Not, not for probably 20 years. Huh. Yeah. Every, well, you know what? We, we, we developed a strategy, I guess, in the early 90s where we said we were only going to have big stores in the best locations. And uh, we've stuck to that pretty true. So we haven't had any marginal performers. Let me ask you about what I guess a lot of people in retail are talking about these days, and that is the American invasion. There are some big name stores coming from the States to compete with you and try and eat your lunch here in Toronto and in other places. Are you worried about this? Well, I, I wouldn't say I'm worried. I'm, I, it, there's a positive and a negative to it. Um, can I tell a story? Sure. The story goes like this, and uh, there's two guys walking through the forest. Let's call one Pete. Now, if somebody said that's Nordstrom's, that's their prerogative. The other <laughs> one's Harry. And uh, they come into a clearing and they see a bear. The bear is ferocious and is growling, and Pete says to Harry, geez, we can't outrun a, a bear. And Harry says, I don't need to. I just have to outrun you. <laughs> and I kind of uh -huh. look at our situation like that. We don't need to be the best all-round retailer covering everything. We just have to be absolutely the best in anything related to menswear. Uh, there's, uh, I love the steam whistle beer phrase, you know, just do one thing really, really well. I, I mean, that to us is, that's all we have to do. We just have to be vastly superior in our area. We have 60 years of understanding the Canadian market. We're in all the best locations. The new additions of the American department stores um, will do only make those locations stronger yet. Uh, they're already strong locations, but Eaton Center, Yorkdale, Sherway, Rideau Center in Ottawa, they're all becoming bigger and stronger and more important centers and we're located front and center in all of them. We've just upgraded our stores and are continuing to do it. I just, uh, and I think we have a service, legendary service culture that I think is not really duplicable, uh, help me with the word duplicatable. Okay. There, okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Anyway, so um, I think that, uh, you know, you can't take anything for granted, but uh, I'm pretty confident that uh, uh, I'm pretty confident that our kind of customer isn't going to wake up one day and say, "Oh, great! I really need to get an American department store to sell me my suit." I just don't know if that's really where they're going to come from. Okay, let me try this on with you. You you know you've obviously been reading the same analysts I have who say Young and Queen in downtown Toronto is becoming a very hot spot, and of course your biggest store is on Bloor Street, and some people wonder whether or not the Bloor location will suffer because of what appears to be an increasing preeminence at Young and Queen. Do you worry about that? You're talking about Eaton Center, of course. Yeah. The addition of Nordstrom's and Saks at, at Eaton Center. Uh, we have a fantastically successful store that we've just enlarged there. Um, and uh, it's doing really well now. I'm, I'm actually very excited at the thought of uh, what's happening there. But what people don't realize about Toronto is that there it's a big, big international city, and it can support more than one major retail area. And Eaton Centre is a great urban centre. Uh, Bloor Street's different. I mean, Bloor Street, you can sell the very highest of the highest, the best of the best. Um, Eaton Centre, you can sell high quality, but it's not the same as Bloor Street. Different clientele? Different clientele, um, different attitude. Um, listen, we have seven stores in Toronto. I mean. Each one is in a very credible thing. There's good, we're in Sherway Gardens. We're expanding, doubling the size of our store there next year. And they're putting a Saks Fifth Avenue and a Nordstrom's in there. I think it's, it's going to be a great center. In Yorkdale, we've just taken our store. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's, we've just tripled the size of it. So we feel very ready for what's happening. And um, I love all our stores. I know you've expanded existing locations, but do you have plans to build new stores in new locations? I have a couple in the back of our mind that we're working on, but uh, the, we're already in all the A-plus malls across the country. There's not a lot of new, new uh, areas we can go in. There's a couple developing areas, but not a lot. Okay. Can we talk some politics? <laughs> sure. The reason I want to is because we don't very frequently get you know, CEOs of multi hundred million dollars corporations come into the studio and I'd like to just sort of check out some of the conventional wisdom of the day with somebody who actually runs a business. Okay. For example, we are told that the 12 billion dollar annual deficit that the province of Ontario is running right now is extremely harmful to our economy. Many people say that. 
Are you one of the people who believes that? I believe it's extremely harmful to our economy. How so? Um, I think that we are mortgaging our children's future. I think that um, uh, people do not really understand continually adding more debt onto more debt onto more debt. Eventually, it has to be paid. And uh, uh, I, I think we have to recognize that, um, you know, people, our children aren't asking us to take on debt on their behalf to finance the current situation. And I think we have to respect that that's their decision and not our decision. That, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if your parents, uh, if you found out suddenly that your parents handed you this giant mortgage and said, oh, by the way, you owe $200,000 mm -hmm. to the government or whoever it is, um, because I decided 25 years ago that you have a, you should have this. I think you'd be pretty upset, and that's what we're doing to the next generation and generation after. So, to me, you uh, eat what you kill, <laughs> and you, you you buy what you can afford. And but then the next question becomes: Okay, what program do you want me to cut in order to bring that deficit down, or whose taxes do you want me to raise to bring that deficit down? Well, they've raised taxes pretty good. Um, um, I think that I think they they just have to make the right decisions and uh, it's not easy I mean look <laughs> we run budgets and make decisions on spending you know we decide what's most important and any in any good business uh, but I, I think that they're just gonna have to make those decisions I mean uh, and you know some of some of the sacred cows may have to go to the wayside listen uh, the Drummond Commission came out with a very well thought out plan on how to deal with the deficit and spending was ignored. Well, they say they've they they say that I think about seventy to seventy five percent of the Drummond recommendations have been implemented. That's what they say. I'm from Missouri, meaning show me you're not believe you don't believe it. Yeah, the truth of the matter is is that um, um, you know I thought a pretty clear roadmap on how to take care of a difficult fiscal situation was presented and. Uh, and put together by a lot of really smart people. This provincial, well, not this one, I guess, the previous provincial government, the McGinty government, harmonized your provincial sales tax with the federal goods and services tax. Right. Was that useful to you? Uh, that is absolutely uh, the best way to run a sales tax, the VAT type tax. It, uh, um, it, it allows the taxation to be collected at the right level and it avoids all sorts of extra feed-ins to the pricing of products. I think it's much more efficient. Okay. They cut your corporate income taxes as well. Did you notice that? Mm-hmm. And what did you do with the money? We've been growing and employing more people, expanding, investing. Um, I've spent probably $50 million on capital investment in the last three years, and I have that much planned for the next three years and that employs people and we're expanding and adding people. I mean, So when the governor of the Bank of Canada and the federal finance minister say to business, we cut your corporate taxes and you guys are sitting on dead money, they're not talking about Larry Rosen. No, I, and, and you know what? There's a lot of businesses that are investing and growing. I mean, it's, uh, I, I don't think that much money is sitting on the sideline, but I'm not an economist. If one of the ways that this current Liberal government, led by Kathleen Wynne, is to stay in power would be to put a surtax on upper income people. Uh, what do you think the advisability of doing that is? Well, they just, didn't, they just did that a, a year or two ago. They did. That was how they secured staying in power last year. But this is a new year. What if they have to do it again to secure NDP votes to stay alive? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I believe uh, I believe that at the end of the day, um, they, I mean, it's not the revenue, it's the spending that's the problem. And uh, increasing revenue, uh, you know, we've seen in the past in England and in France where the economies have basically become non-productive because they basically scared um, all the innovators out. And I think we have to be very careful. I mean. Right now, the marginal rate in Ontario for the highest earners is 49%. And uh, I think that's a pretty effective rate. I mean, at what point does it stop? You know, does it stop? I don't know this for sure, 
but my hunch is they're thinking, look at Larry Rosen's got stores all over this country. He's not going anywhere. He can't leave. His business is here. He's got stakes in the ground all over look, the place. I'm Canadian, true and true. I'm staying. But there are, there are other mobile businesses. I mean, uh, there are lots of businesses that have a choice of venue. And uh, uh, we should work really hard to keep as many employers here as possible. I mean, it's about jobs, really. Mm -hmm. They make me feel like I'm running for office here. <laughs> well, I'm all right. Not. As, as long as I, 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 I've never had any interest <laughs> in politics besides being uh, reading the papers. I'm a, I'm a tailor. Come on, Steve. Okay. Well, as long as I'm on a roll, let me ask you one more. There's a minority government at Queens Park right now. Does business prefer when it's a majority government? Uh, I, I, I'm happy when there's an effective government. It's, there's been effective minority and there's been effective majority governments. So. And effective I, means just decisive? Yeah, decisive, uh, creating policy that works for the people, that creates jobs, that runs a sensible fiscal ship. Uh, you know, listen, you know, uh, proper health care, all, all the things that you need out of a, a strong provincial government. I'm not, education, can't forget that. I mean, these are important initiatives. I mean, it's managing and balancing the priorities, um, but it, ca it can be done Minority can be done majority. I don't really care. Do you say who you vote for? I don't. You want to tell me? <laughs> <laughs> you don't ask, you don't find out. No. Uh, okay, one last question then, Larry, and that is, you've seen your share of politicians over the years. Who's the best dressed politician you've seen? Well, um, I, actually, I think Obama's a very good dresser. I think he really is. Um, I'm avoiding the answer in Canada uh, Why? Be, because they're all my clients. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> no, I, I can't. Uh, we, we can't discuss who our clients are. But many of the, uh, of the leaders in this country shop with us, and I don't want to, uh, to prefer. I love all my children. You know, they're all, they're all great. Equally. Um, I, I, I think Obama. You know what? If I can, in history, I have to say that uh, Trudeau had a sense of flair, Pierre always had a sense of flair, so that's, it's harmless. And I know Sir John A. Macdonald was quite a dandy as well. And I know he's, uh, you're, uh, you're a big fan of him. D your father didn't fit him, did he? Uh, yes, he, 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 no, had he, a, he had a low right shoulder. No, I think <laughs> he not. He did not, he's <laughs> he not that old. My dad didn't start, uh, my dad wasn't born until 1931, so I think not. Okay, I gotcha. Uh, Larry Rosen, it's good of you to come in here today and uh, talk to us about your business, which is 60 years young this year. We wish you many more, thanks a lot. Thank you, I'm so honored to be here at such a it's my favorite show. <laughs> Thanks so much. Take care. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.